organized. He's also an associate managing editor of the journal Latin American Perspectives. Elmer received his master's degree in at Southern Connecticut State University and his PhD at the University of New Mexico. All his degrees are in Latin American history. You have the floor, Dr. Elmer. Thank you very much. Um, does everybody hear me? No problem with you? Okay. I'm uh, in Venezuela uh, where I have spent uh, about half of my adult life. Um, and I want to just begin by saying that there is a big gap uh, between the stated purpose of sanctions and the discourse of those who defend sanctions on the one hand and what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, all international sanctions have exceptions. They're built into them. Uh, and those exceptions are typically food and medicine, for instance. Um, furthermore, there is a classif classification known as targeted sanctions, which means that the sanctions supposedly are directed only at individuals um, or individual companies. But it's a well-known fact that sanctions of any nature produce what is known as over-reliance. That means that commercial, financial, manufacturing, enterprises, any place in the world, um, they fear that any transaction with that nation that's being sanctioned, uh, that they'll be on the receiving end, that there will be secondary sanctions imposed on them as a penalty for having anything to do with that nation. And I think that the, the best proof, uh, other people will talk about other you know, aspects, negative aspects of the sanctions, but I think that the best proof of the nefarious effect of sanctions is that the vast majority of the citizens of those countries that are being sanctioned are opposed to the sanctions. Gallup polls indicate, um, I'm an expert on Venezuela, but in the Middle East as well, you have the, kind of, the same kind of situation in which the majority of people are opposed to sanctions. One of the leading members of the Venezuelan opposition uh, who lives in Maryland uh, told me in Maryland, where, where I'm also based, that with just a few exceptions, the leaders of the Venezuelan opposition, those who are opposed to the present government of Nicolas Maduro, they don't express support for sanctions in Venezuela. And that it's only in Miami where just the opposite takes place. In Miami, the moderate opposition leaders who are opposed to the sanctions, they don't dare support them because they would fear of being driven out of town. But in Venezuela, it's just the opposite. And all public opinion polls, all of them, indicate that 80% of the people of Venezuela are completely opposed to sanctions. And not only 80% of the general population, but the business sector, the Chamber of Commerce in Venezuela, known, known as Fede Comitas, they're also opposed to the sanctions. Um, the president of Fede Comitas, Adan Chelis, uh, as well as the past president, they've all talked about the devastating effect of over-reliance. In other words, a term that you know we use in the States, uh, over-reliance being that um, those products such as food and medicine that are exempted uh, end up um, not getting traded to Venezuela because of fear that any transaction with Venezuela will result in secondary sanctions. The past president of Fede Comitas, Ricardo Cusano, uh, talked about how difficult it is for Venezuelan business people just to open a bank account abroad. And Fede Comitas, the Chamber of Commerce, has done a study that indicates that 17.5% of the effect of the sanctions has fallen on their shoulders, on the shoulders of business people. Um, there's one exception in, in the case of Venezuela, and that's the current candidate for president, the president, the most important presidential candidate uh, against Maduro, um, very controversial figure by the name of Maria Corina Machado, and she supports the sanctions. Uh, she just won the primaries that were held on Sunday. But just a few hours after those primaries were held, um, the leading pollster in Venezuela, a name that everybody in Venezuela knows, Luis Vicente Leon, he himself is openly identified with the opposition. 
And he stated that his surveys indicate that 70% of the people who support Maria Corina Machado, in other words, the practically the only candidate that is uh, th that is supporting the sanctions against Venezuela, but 70% of the people who are voting for her are opposed to the sanctions. Um, naturally, with such a high percentage of people who are opposed to sanctions, the attitudes towards the United States are neg negatively affected. In a nutshell, U.S. prestige has suffered throughout the world as a result of the sanctions, which people generally consider to be unjust. This is especially true in the Middle East. Gallup polls indicate um, that this is the case throughout the Middle East. Uh, Gallup poll in 2022 indicated that, it, that even more than uh, any place else in the Middle East, in Iran, people uh, hold the U.S. responsible for their situation. That poll indicated in just last year that only 9% of people living in Iran who responded to that survey uh, trust the U.S. commitment to democracy, while 81% of people in Iran said the U.S. is not serious about democracy. 82% responded that the U.S. is not serious about improving their economic situation. These Gallup polls contradict what much of the U.S. media is, is saying, namely that Iranians uh, embrace pro-Western values and opinions. That might have been the case in the past, but the sanctions have changed that situation. And not only is our prestige being seriously negatively affected, but the possibility that countries uh, fearing sanctions will move away from the US dollar. That becomes more and more of a threat every day. International sanctions against countries like Venezuela and Iran and the possibility of sanctions being imposed on other countries um, that may have differences with the US because of cultural differences, political differences, just the possibility that sanctions will be opposed is enough to convince political leaders across the political spectrum to move away from the dollar as the nations of BRICS are currently doing. The BRICS consisted of five nations, now six new members, uh, including Iran, uh, have uh, entered. So there are now 11 members of BRICS. And sanctions have become a driver for the, the declining use of the dollar in international transactions. At the last summit of BRICS in Johannesburg, President Lula of Brazil called for a, a BRICS currency. And he said, the purpose of my proposal is not to displace the dollar but to allow member nations to have an option. Now, why did Lula say that? Why did Lula frame the issue along those lines? I believe that the purpose of Lula's proposal was to give countries like Iran and Russia that are being sanctioned and any other nation in the future that uh, gets sanctioned um, an opportunity, an option to circumvent the sanctions. Some countries are arguing that the use of sanctions, which are made possible by the use of the dollar as an international medium of exchange, is an abuse of Bread and Woods, the Bread and Woods Agreement of 1944, which never meant to confer on the United States political power of this nation, of this nature. So just to summarize, I think I'm nearing my, my 10 or 15 minute limit. Um, so just to summarize, what I'm trying to say here, the U.S. is basically shooting itself in the foot by relying on sanctions to further its agenda. Its international prestige is taking a hit and its economic interests are being endangered. Thank you. Uh, we will have Dr. Richard Cohn who is a professor at the University of Maryland's College of Agriculture. After working in Nicaragua with the Union of Farmers and Ranchers, UNA, in the 1980s, he visited the country several times and now offers a winter term study abroad course in sustainable agriculture and environment in Nicaragua. His studies include evaluating and implementing, implementing methods to decrease adverse environmental effects from agriculture and the effects of US sanctions on climate change. 
You have the floor for such a point. I'm going to stand up so I can see everybody. Uh, the first thing that we have to understand <laughs> about sanctions is that developing countries' economies and their agriculture and their food systems are already broken before we even start. Uh, the problem is that developing countries import a lot of their state or staple foods and export foods that are not essential to the United States, like coffee and fruit. So they rely on imports and exports for their very survival. So the sanctions on a country's exports or their imports are devastating and they basically cause hunger, which is what they're intending to do. Whether their sanctions on gold or coffee or beef or food itself or medicine, their intended target is to make people suffer, despite what the people who talk about these sanctions might say. Countries that try to escape from this model imposed on them by the United States are considered a threat to the security of the United States. The model that they're opposing is the idea that they have to get all their food from the United States and we can export specific things. So economic development, trade with other countries, domestic food production are all considered specific threats to the order. If their elections or their militaries can't be manipulated easily, then they're slated to regime change and the sanctions cut them to bring about regime change. That is the goal of the sanctions. The sanctions, sanctions push resistant countries like Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua toward trade agreements with other countries. It's one of the things the U.S. considers a threat. And they also push them to developing their own agriculture and their own food systems so they can feed themselves. Another threat. And so the U.S. continues to ramp up the sanctions because they're completely failed in being their goal of overthrowing the government and taking over the system. <clears throat> How did this come about? We learned long ago in the United States that agriculture does not work very well with free market capitalism without regulation. Agriculture is a very unpredictable business. You know, it may not rain one year, you have a drought, you don't have enough food. And so we intentionally made policies because even in a good year, if everybody produces lots of food, there's too much food and the price falls out and a lot of people go out of business. So we figured that it was very unstable and it needed to be stabilized. So we developed this system of price supports. So it's ag policy. We buy up excess food when there's excess food available in the United States, and then we, we don't have the price fallout, so we keep agriculture. That means every year we're producing more food than we need by design, unless we have a drought or some sort of catastrophic event. And we're still prepared that we produce just enough. So we don't start. We have a very stable ag economy. But the problem with this ag economy is that we're constantly producing too much food and it's not easy to store it. So what do we do with that extra food? Well, in the 1960s, uh, JFK and then Nixon got this idea that there were countries where people were hungry. So we should just ship them our extra food. And so we started this practice of food for peace. But the problem with that is that when we had extra food, now, the farmers in those countries could not compete. They couldn't provide produced food and compete with the US imports. And so they went out of business. And so now we have a system when there's some sort of problem, when you don't have good production, we are okay because we just don't have extra food. We just don't export it. But what about the countries that also don't have any food and they can't import it? So now the whole, all of the risk is placed on them. And so that is how we, we fell into this. And so even in the 1980s, Reagan deemed that one of his major objectives was to get countries like Guatemala and Nicaragua, um, which had massive starvation, hungry starvation, to get them to produce more export crops, like he, he said, strawberries and uh, asparagus, and import grain from the United States. And then we had the free trade agreement in 2004, the CAFTA. And the idea was that US companies would export our agriculture surplus and we would import more from Central America, and Latin America, and the Caribbean. 
So again, emphasizing that we're trying to keep this system alive. But the problem is <clears throat> that it doesn't actually work for most people in developing countries. Um, because what happens is the landowners get wealthier and they make dollars, which they use to buy luxury items to, for their life. They don't use those dollars to feed their population of their country. And so hunger gets worse, even though they're exporting these crops. So the system doesn't work and it gets to the point where you have a samosa or you know, in the case in, in uh, Cuba where people are literally hungry while they have this vibrant economy, export-based economy. And some people are very comfortable and very wealthy. So you have revolution. And when that revolution occurs, one of the things that they try to do is to help them produce their own food, uh, give land to peasants so that they can produce them because they know how to do it. And those revolutions are exactly what we call in the United States communist today. <laughs> so <clears throat> we have sanctions today, and it's a step, it's a step of war. We have propaganda uh, to demonize every country that we want to overthrow in order to keep this system uh, in place. So um, Nicaragua, well, let me give you uh, some, some more background. Well, the long-term goal of sanctions is to overthrow countries. It's not very good at that. We haven't been very successful in the cases where we've applied sanctions in Cuba or Venezuela, but it is good at the objective. So when you have goals, a broader long-term picture, then you have objectives to get to your goals. And one of the objectives is create hunger, create suffering, starving, medical issues, create all kinds of problems so that people won't like these governments, which they currently like. They are popular governments because of the fact that they provide for people's health and food. So don't, you know, deny them the ability to do that. So for example, the sanctions on gold in the, in the law itself, it says this is to deny the Nicaraguan government the ability to tax these, the, uh, this industry, to, to, to destroy the gold exporting industry is a way to keep the government from getting money. How does the Nicaraguan use, government use the money that it obtains? More than half is for social programs. And a lot of the rest could arguably be social programs as well, the infrastructure to develop and make the economy more efficient. So we're talking about you know, directly targeting their ability to keep themselves. So we're good at the objective. They do make people suffer but they don't overthrow governments very often, with the exception in 1990. So the US used sanctions and war, country war, funding terrorists, to attack the agricultural system in rural uh, areas, um, to destroy hospitals, and healthcare clinics, to make it so people would be afraid to live in rural areas. And if they can't live in the rural areas, they won't farm. So to destroy their food system, they, they engaged in this, this contra war. And on top of that, used very, very restrictive sanctions. And of course, it eventually broke the economy. And people voted for the neoliberal government that the United States wanted to be put forward. And uh, well, an oligarchy family that had, had six presidents uh, who had served in Nicaragua, including the, the one the US supported right before uh, it was supporting Samosa. Uh, so this family uh, got, um, got power again in Nicaragua, thanks to the U.S. help and the sanctions that play an important role in doing that. So there we achieved our goal. But was it the right goal? Because after she came into power and the success of the liberal governments for 16 years, they cut education, they cut food programs, they cut, uh, so illiteracy went up, infrastructure, fell apart, they, the government cuts in all sorts of programs and they took the land away from the peasants who had received the land in the previous government. So again, they can't produce food for themselves. Conditions got even worse after the war stopped, or at least they were just as bad, they didn't improve. And so there you have the, the problem that the Nicaraguan people are faced with. They can vote out, they can vote in the government the US wants and starve, 
or they invoke the first of the government that they really want and start as sanctions. Mm -hmm. So one way or the other, they lose, so they might as well lose. And it, it takes a lot. It's not like, oh, well, it's a little inconvenient for me, so I'm going to vote for this other government. No, it has to be extremely, extremely uh, difficult before they're going to vote for the U.S. backed candidates. So in each of these cases, all of these countries work together to try to achieve food sovereignty. Nicaragua is 90% food sovereignty today. So they produce 90% of their own food. They still rely on some fertilizers, things for, as, as imports, but they're doing less of that because of the food systems, the research that they're doing and things that they're implementing. Uh, but that doesn't mean they're not, that the sanctions don't still have an effect because even the exports that are sanctioned, and they can't, they can't sell the major commodities to the United States to this trade department. That means they're not gonna be able to get things that they can't produce themselves. Uh, technology, for example, to modernize, to make things more efficient. So, <clears throat> If you know the history of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, Venezuela, the way the people live there do, you would understand that it'll take a lot, a real lot, to, to make that goal of overthrowing those governments. And, you know, we really don't have any business doing that. Their determination isn't irrational. It's based on their knowledge, their experience. They lose either way, so they're taking the sanctions instead of siding with the government we want to put in place. And we lose as well, like that coffee over there. It's still legal to import it. It's, it's sustainably produced, has low impact on the environment, including greenhouse gas effects, which affect us. Um, and it tastes really good. Mm -hmm. um, those are the sorts of things that they're targeting. So <clears throat> the chair of the Justice Department, or the Justice Department admitted that the chair of foreign affairs, you know, um, Senator Mendez was taking bribes from various oligarchs in exchange for promoting policies like these policies. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many others are also taking these bribes, but we're just letting that go. You have to question, you know, any of these policies that somebody like that is promoting, you know, what is the basis for that? Who do they benefit? Because they only benefit the small, elite, land holding elite, oligarchic families at the expense, and they benefit some U.S. companies, but at the expense of a lot of people. And that is ultimately, uh, you know, the, the system that we have needs to be reconsidered, and we need to even look at ag policy. And there are certainly ways that we could manage our, our surpluses that wouldn't be detrimental to people of uh, developing countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Next, we have Dr. Ann Faust, who is an expert in maternal and child health, who has worked in a variety of countries. Uh, Dr. Faust is a neonatal surgeon and fellow with the Global Children's Health Program. She is a former World Health Organization surgeon and humanitarian worker, former UN human rights investigator and current WHO code keeper. Anne is also a mother of four. You have the floor, Dr. Fast. Thank you very much. I'm also gonna stand up because, I don't know, it feels right. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I'll address the elephant in the room. Um, I live in uh, Howard County, Maryland. And if you're going to say now, if I ever Howard County accent, this has to be the weirdest one. <laughs> Obviously, I'm born uh, North Yorkshire, England, England, but not London, up north. Um, I've been calling this country my home for the last 20 years, yeah, 23 years in 10 days' time to the day. Um, this is important because. Um, if you are born into something, you don't realize how privileged to be in there. I chose this country to be my country. I chose to raise my children in this country. I'm an adopted American, so this is a privilege I'm aware of. My U.S. passport is a privilege. My children's U.S. passports are also privileges. And this is also something important. I would like them to know this power and use this one. 
But this is why it is important for me how U.S. represents itself abroad. Um, I am mother of four, as I said. <clears throat> My connection to Nicaragua started, funnily enough, with a Professor Kohn's wife. Uh, she's a clinician at the same place I work. Uh, keep my mother and baby clinic um, and she just came to me and said that oh we're going to Nicaragua it's a woman's um, delegate and it just would you like to come I, said, I don't know anything about Nicaragua I always worked in Africa and Middle East and um, Far East um, so I said oh yes I mean it's, we're going in January it just it beats being in a uh, Central American country it's been in Columbia, Maryland, any day of the January. So I said yes, and I took my two younger sons at the time. They were nine and um, twelve, I think, uh, and my daughter, who studied, uh, still studies um, psychology and women and gender studies, because it was a woman's delicate. I wanted to see. I wanted her to experience other how the other woman lives in the world. And I went to Nicaragua with, I had no political agenda. I had no sociological agenda. I knew nothing about it. And if you have, uh, I'm sure most of you experienced about Nicaragua and Central America, just I'm going to ask you to drop those along and walk with me the path I walked for the next 10 minutes or so. If you have any questions, please go ahead and ask. Um, I'm more than happy to answer the best of my ability. So um, what I do, I... Been a doctor for 28 years now, and I've been doing uh, maternal child health care in various departments in various countries. Um, and that was my main you know, point of interest. What do they do? How do they um, think? Of course, I told my friends and family, and they said, oh, you're going to go to Nicaragua? You're going to take in the children with you? I said, oh, God, what am I doing now? But I paid for the tickets. I'm from North Yorkshire. I'm going to go anyway. Mm -hmm. So here I am. We go to the plane. We arrive. People are incredibly pleasant at the entrance. And then from there to taxi driver is lovely. We just arrive in the middle of the night in this beautiful place. The birds are still chirping in the middle of the night. And in the morning, um, we ate and packed to go. Rice is incredibly important in the Caribbean. They eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and if we go with the sanctions, one of the things US is going to take away from them is the rice. I'm gonna talk as a mom here. I will never respect anyone who takes food away from my children's family. This is, if there's any parents in this room, I cannot imagine you'll think differently. What is US's achievement? What is our goal by implementing sections? Because if we want the government to change, change their ways, then we have to do our things. We have to change our methods. Taking food out of children, taking medication out of people is not the way to go. I will never respect, just like any of you, I'm sure, if anybody takes from my family and my children. So what have I seen in Nicaragua? They had an amazing way of doing medicine. Um, what they have done, they started with the grassroots. You have got a neighborhood, you have got a neighborhood. I chose you, I chose you, or you come forward, and I trained you. You are the first person to approach to that neighborhood for all health needs. This could be mental health, this could be physical health. Mental health is really, really important because I'm sure, again, many of you are better experts than I am ever going to be. Um, had a lot of issues with uh, women's, women's beating up, domestic violence, all of those. So if you live in this community, if your husband is beating you up, I'm gonna know it because I live next door. So even if you don't want to tell me, I'm gonna come with a cup of coffee in your home in the morning and I'm gonna say, what is going on? Do tell. It is much easier to talk to a friend than somebody else. But if you want to go to that somebody else, they did something, again, to me, incredibly amazing. They created this police stations, all for women, made out of women. I'm gonna ask uh, those who you um, identify yourself as a female. If you're in a stress situation, who would you like to go to talk to, a woman or a man? Yeah. We all did. It doesn't matter how old you are and um, how do we do. Um, the other thing it just struck me is, Nicaraguans are really, really poor. I mean, really poor. Most of the houses I've visited has got um, um, soil floors. Granted, it's cleaner than my kitchen floor, but nevertheless, most of them don't even have running water. 
However, guess what? They all have electricity. They all have internet. My dear phone, who uses T-Mobile, has got always difficult. I work in uh, Washington, D.C., in children's. I've got black spots all over the place. I can't reach my phone. Had never had any issues in Nicaragua. It's up on the mountains where the, uh, they were growing the coffee or down in the cities. Never had any issues because their government think this is one of the human rights, which it is. So um, we went to the hospitals. We went to the little clinics. Little clinics is the um, about the no second step of their healthcare system is the pharmacies. You can get a pharmacy pretty much at the end of every street corner. The third is the small clinics. Um, the place we stayed actually was a sponsor of one of these such clinics in the neighborhood. We had a privilege to go there, talk with the nurses, talk with the dentists, talk with the doctors over there. Um, and they all talking about uh, how accessible they are. In here, when you try to make an appointment with your dermatologist, and we are one of the better countries, mind you, you have to wait about three months. Um, over there, this is not the issue. You need it, you pretty much would be seen within a couple of days, even if not necessarily with a dermatologist, at least you get your first appointment, uh, they start you with something and they escalate your issues. Um, the other thing they do this incredibly well in there, they don't expect you to come to them. Just like us, they also have to work and work hard. Um, so for women's issues especially, they have these massive buses, mammograms. I'm at that age now, I have to get my breast squeezed. It just, I'm taking image of it. I'm telling you, if this was a man, this would have been changed by now for a long time ago. If you're a man, I'll squeeze it away, it doesn't matter. And in which ways, they take the mammograms in these big uh, buses into the big factories where there are mostly women working. So you don't have to take time off. You don't have to try to find a childcare. You have to, you know, the healthcare comes to you. This is a massive thing. And I mean, I can see some of you are just um, skeptics around you. Just you're with the friend here. I am an absolute skeptic. So I thought they're putting a show for us because we're a you know group. They're taking us what they want to see. So what do I do? I take my sons. I take my daughter. I just walk away to just make his poor Jill just sweat. Where did she go now? Our <laughs> boss, where are you? Um, I go to the, you know, market. I go to the talk to the woman on the. I speak no Spanish, mind you. My son speaks a little bit. Google Translate is wonderful. Hand gestures are wonderful. Willingness is even better than anything else you can talk to anybody in the world. So I talk with people. I buy things to eat on the thing. They're happy. This lady, it just she makes this um, the best tasting corn breads, patty kind of things. There. This is her livelihood. She is happy. She's constantly laughing. She's got her grandchildren over there. She's talking to other people. Other people are happy. So I haven't seen miserable people. I haven't walked around the downtown DC. Mm -hmm. Most of us, including me, mm -hmm. we don't like our jobs. We don't like our, I have to work most weeks over 50 hours. I have a phone. I have an accessibility. I work about 100 hours a week. You don't have this. If you're a breastfeeding mom, you had a new baby, you start work an hour late, you go home an hour early, and you get uh, pumping rights. I had to work for this years in the US. We just passed this one. And we have so many. We want women to work. We want women to work at home. We want women to be happy. Well, you have to give up one thing. You usually give up the happiness, because that's the easiest. Well, I don't know if that's true, but here we go. So this was one of the compounds of family thing. The other thing is just shocked me how their government was uh, investing in the women and family. Um, we went to different coffee places and uh, I met with these amazing women. One of them, I still can't get over her. She is, I mean, I'm short, as you see, she's shorter than me. She is thin, but fierce as a, Higher. Um, these were all three women. They were all victims of domestic violence. And they reached, um, they have got a system of, you know, getting the men away from the immediate thing, training the men, and they giving them another chance to involve with the family. This is also very important. They don't say men are bad and just you're out. They are training them, they're educating them. And 
recuperating with the family. The man offends again, or woman offends again, uh, you know, less likely, but it is possible. Then they took them out and, you know, put them away. Well, again, I'm going to ask the woman amongst yourself, if you have issues with your partners, the number one fear of all of us, where am I going to go with my children? This is across the world is safe in Nicaragua, in Botswana, in, you know, um, Sierra Leone, doesn't matter. Well, um, <clears throat> they find a solution. These three women, uneducated, mind you, they barely read and write, approach the government. We have children. We have, you gave us the house. Oh, that's another thing. If this is happens, uh, when you get married, a uh, house ownership becomes 50-50. And this 50-50, if you're imprisoned because of domestic violence, it becomes 100% of the woman's. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. I have a home. The rest of it, I can make it. But now I have to feed the kids. So this government gave them um, coffee, and they gave them a land, and they told them how to produce this coffee. This lady I'm talking about, she said, I'm going to learn how to read and write. She did learn how to read and write. She finished high school equivalent, and she even went to university, which is free to everyone. And she studied, um, uh, I, I can't remember what she did. But today they have an international coffee um, thing, which you can actually buy some of it here in DC, as well as in um, Baltimore. Uh, they were so, uh, another similar group of five, six women, were so impressed, Oxfam, some of you might have heard, is an international organization, gave them an, uh, money to improve their abilities. Today, they don't just do coffee. They have got also wine. They have got also tea. They know how to do um, biodynamic uh, agriculture. Of course, you know, Professor Paul would know better than me. Um, but what they do is they're... Um, leftover production, it just turned to a um, something else into feed the trees they grow. So nothing is thrown away, nothing is just wasted. It's they are enough for what they are. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but they still as the uh, import rice correct today. Well, right. I mean, uh, so what are we gonna take away from these people by taking away their rice? because this is one of the sanctions, it's a food sanction in there. What are we gonna take away from these people when we take away their uh, medicine? I have seen this, I have seen this happening. I have seen the children passing out on the stretchers because there is no anesthesia, because there is no x-ray. We just thought that, oh, they can be used to make. Can you tell us where you've seen that? Um, I have seen it in Sierra Leone, Syria, um, and lately actually on the um, border, uh, well, uh, in Palestine, it just only about a week ago. This is a uh, seven months old baby was in a stretcher. Um, there were no humanitarian aids were going in and uh, it was terrible. I mean, seven months old child lost the left foot, passed out on a stretcher. We are better than this. I would like my children to be better than this. I would like my children to, when they go to other country, the other country people wouldn't look at their passport and say, oh, you're an American. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to do this. I chose this country to come here. I would like my children to be as proud as I am. They're born into it. They may not know the privilege they're in, but I would like them to know. I would like your children to know this because it is a big privilege. And I would like my country to do better. I would like my country to be like Finland, my, where my father's from. No Finnish person would ever worries about it just when they go with their passport. I would like United States to be like that. As I said, I'm not a politician. I don't know how to best achieve this. If you're a politician, please find a different way than taking children and medicine from people. They also, so they shouldn't be using a white vinegar to sterilize things. Doctors shouldn't be just going around your arm where just broken from three different places. Try to fix it with just by feeling. This is what I come to ask from you. This is my experience from Nicaragua. If you have any questions, um, I'm more than welcome to answer best of my ability. Thank you, Dr. Sorry. Yeah. Um, now we'll hear from Dr. Scott Hageman, Friends of Latin America. 
I'm a child of an adolescent psychiatrist. I grew up in a pop Christian in Chicago Center City. And so when I heard about sanctions, um, it really gets home. We heard at the <coughs> introduction of this one from those that many people think of sanctions as being less violent, less violent intervention. And sanctions are considered by many to be a blunt instrument. But they're pointed as they affect those who are unseen and without a voice, like I was growing up. The poor, the elderly, the disabled, the infirm, and our infants and our children. I'm going to read um, Reflections of Camille and Mary. These are her words. I was born and raised in Cuba and moved to the United States with my husband over 20 years ago. I love my family and the opportunity to live among so many generous, open-minded, and kind people. We have two precious children aged eight and 10 years old. They are starting to try to understand the wider world we live in beyond our family, friends, schools, and neighbors. The last couple of times we visited my family in Cuba, they saw people in long lines waiting to shop in grocery stores, only to come out with shopping bags that were not very full. They have noticed that people are thinner, more worried about making ends meet, worried about simply finding the food and medicine they need. The people of Cuba have experienced more electricity blackouts and cannot drive their cars very far away for fear of running out of gas. My children see this and then later hear that this person who they know is no longer living in Cuba, but has moved to the United States because they finally lost hope of the situation of them. When they ask me why, I have to tell them that the US has sanctions, has many sanctions, has had sanctions against Cuba for over 60 years, and that under the last two US administrations, <laughs> even more sanctions than we did. That it is impossible for Cubans to live much better under such circumstances. They ask, why the sanctions? I tell them that the U.S. government says that it is to help the Cuban people. And they ask, how does this help? What am I to tell my children? That unfortunately, I don't think the U.S. government really wants to help Cubans. That the U.S. embargo against is itself the greatest violation of Cubans' right to live a violation of those very same people that the U.S. government says that it is trying to help. And then they ask me, why would they lie like that? My own children. There is nothing to explain, really. That the U.S. government doesn't like the Cuban government. My oldest son, responds, he's 10 years old. Then the Cuban government should sanction the U.S. too and treat them the same way. My son, I tell them that the U.S. is a much bigger country and that Cubans, even if they could, know that the U.S. people are not to blame for what the U.S. government is doing, that they would not approve of hurting other people that my daughter says, that is bullying. Just because you are bigger, we should not keep on picking on smaller people. 
What do you say to children when they ask your government to escrow lumber for them? Why does the US government have to make so many people suffer in the world in the name of supposed values and ideals that it is proving to not really care about? Why does it keep doing this to the Cuban people for the longest time? With no positive results, only families broken and people dead because of irregular migration. You must know what everyone with a free heart and free mind knows that sanctions cause hardship and suffering for the entire population. The chief result of change are unjust must be illegal and don't produce any positive results. They hurt both peoples, the conscience of the people of the US in whose names the sanctions are imposed, and of course the people of Cuba who then suffer under those sanctions. I ask you, how much longer do we have to wait for the US government to do the right thing? By we, I mean both the people of Cuba and the people of the United States. How much longer do we have to wait? President Obama seemed to understand this. President Biden should, too. He promised this in his campaign. With the stroke of a pen, President Biden can alleviate a lot of unnecessary suffering for millions and millions of people and bring hope again. But I fear that he is only listening to the people who benefit from the sanctions and the conflict of both countries. You can urge President Biden to, at a minimum, take Cuba off the state sponsors of terrorism list. Wave Title III of the Helms Burton Act. Lift many of the other 240 sanctions imposed by President Trump. Please help us. You can. I hope you will. We're depending on you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hubbard. Marilyn Hubbard. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> uh, I think I was. I think I was chosen because I've, I've been an activist for Nicaragua for a number of years and I've been there around six times. And uh, when I went first, I saw. A, a country poorer than, than Cuba that I had previously seen. I saw a country where the children had carried their chairs down the street to where school was being held because there were no facilities. And their parents, if they could, would send the children to school. If they couldn't afford the small fee, which was small, but these are public schools, there's, there should be no fee. Uh, they meant children didn't go. Um, we're worried about the Senate Bill 1881, because as we have heard, it will prohibit imports. Also investments of any American company that would want to invest in Nicaragua or Cuba or Venezuela. Um, I'm worried about Honduras, which is next door and probably the most dangerous, probably the most dangerous country in Central America or all of Latin America um, because of extortion, because of the cartels. I go to the, um, Immigration Court, is that the proper name, in Baltimore to help interpret for people who are there because they tried to, they, they hope for amnesty and they tell stories that I'm supposed to try to keep a straight face and not cry when they're, they're telling some of the abuse they've suffered. Honduras and other countries have, have some, Hondurans and other peoples of Central and Latin America have many reasons to try to come here, but we're not talking about immigration today. If we destroy the ability for Nicaragua to belong to CAFTA, the DR CAFTA, 
uh, that changes their role in their, their relationships with their neighbors. They've been good neighbors regardless of the politics of the countries around them. And of course, we are all worried about more migration for many reasons, for what costs psychologically and physically to get here and, and live through the process of walking, but also because we don't know what to do with all of them. And, and most of them would be happier to stay home, but they can't live. Either they can't make it because of the dry corridor where they can't farm, climate change is changing their ability to farm in Guatemala and, 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 and Nicaragua, and I don't know about other places. So they can't make a living or they're scared or they, their grandmother has been threatened or their mother's been killed or their uncle or their cousin. So this is going to add to migration because it can't be, they can't import the food they need. Speaking of rice, beans and rice is Cayo Pinto, and this is my shirt about Cayo Pinto. Those are the main ingredients of a very popular dish. But in, in addition to seeing children walking with their chairs to somebody's house to have school, um, there was there was electricity for two or three hours a day if you were lucky. And because they got their water by pump in the city where I go to visit, which is in line and on the border, they get their water luckily because there's a pumping system, but not there's no electricity. So you're out of electricity and water. But this is back in the early 90s after the neoliberal government has been elected. So those are the wonderful things they brought. In addition to increasing the um, the rate of whatever that word, liter illiteracy. So so it had gotten better during the first Sandinista government and then during the neoliberal government, illiteracy rates rose greatly. And, and now under the Sandinista government again, it's way, way, way down. But what I was fascinated and struck by in, in the summer of 2022 was the changes that have happened in the latest Sandinista government. And that's the one they are opposing. Uh, and we talked and talked about the, the medical situation. They, they have trained 1,700 specialists in, in different medical specialties, most of them in Nicaragua, a few that they've sent out for training. They have, they have a, a system of something called Casa Cuna, where a woman who lives far from a hospital in the countryside somewhere can go and stay a couple of weeks before she's expecting, you've probably heard about yeah. those, before she's expecting to have to, the birth of, the, of her child so that she's being cared for for those couple of weeks and fed. And then she's close to some city with that, with the um, medical care. So um, another thing that is happening is small loans, usually given to women. You know, banks tend in, in Costa Rica or or El Salvador, wherever you, any other country that I don't know anything about, big banks don't like to give $200 loans. You know, so people that need just a little bit of money for their farming, and especially women, can get those loans. Why women? Because it's been shown that they're more responsible with the money that they loaned. So how did all this change happen? How come there are so many more hospitals? How come education is everywhere? Hospitals are everywhere or healthcare clinics. How did this change happen? The, the road, the highway that we used to take to our community of Limay used to take three hours because it was full of rocks and it was mostly dirt. And now it's a, it's a super highway, it got there in an hour. Where did all the money come for all the for all this infrastructure? A beautiful bridge that the people are so proud of. The bus that I used to take would have to go through, you know, and ford the creek. It wasn't a high river except in big rains, and then you wouldn't go. <laughs> you just don't go. I I was astonished until we learned from ministers of government, many of whom are women, by the way. We met with six or seven ministries, and most of the women, most of the people that had the cabinet positions were women. Um, it's the Central America Bank. The Central America Bank officially is called the uh, Central America Bank of Economic Integration. I um, they that's the one bank that can loan to Nicaragua. If this 
Senate Bill 1881 passes, they won't be able to access that. Of course, the World Bank doesn't want to loan. And American banks wouldn't dare loan. So it's very hard for them to get the money that they need to do all these things that they've been doing since 2007. And they have a great record of paying these loans back. So they continue to get the loan after they pay the previous ones. So this is what is keeping people alive. This is what is keeping people fed. This is what's keeping med medical care and education for all of Nicaragua's. And I was very, very pleased to have that experience last year. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, but at least we have Leonardo Flores of the Venezuela Solidarity Network. Thank you so much, Lucy. And I also want to take a second to thank Jill and Michelle and Sanctions Bill for organizing this. So I'm going to speak briefly a little bit about the consequences of sanctions on Venezuela before moving on to talk about the deal that was recently signed between the Venezuelan government and opposition, as well as the sanctions relief offered by the United States about a week and a half ago, and then finish up on what we're really looking for for Congress in the upcoming months. Keep your voice up. Keep your voice up. Okay, so the Trump administration imposed sanctions, began imposed its first sanctions on Venezuela in August 2017, according to the Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR. And between August 2017 and August 2018, those sanctions led to 40,000 excess deaths in Venezuela. So that's 40,000 people who died because of the Trump administration sanctions. By 2020, March 2020, a UN special rapporteur upgraded that figure to 100,000 deaths in Venezuela due to sanctions. So how do people die from sanctions? Well, in the case of Venezuela, these sanctions led to a 99% decrease in government revenue. And we're talking about a government that routinely spent around 80% of its budget on social spending, the bulk of it going to health, education, and other programs. So without suddenly you lose all of that funding and the health care system completely collapsed. There was a huge increase in maternal mortality, a country that had really met almost every single millennium development goal suddenly lost about 15 to 20 years of development. So now, so now the, the country that was a middle-income country becomes a low-income country. You saw food insecurity skyrocket from 22% in 2013 to 14% by late 2018, 2019. The economy, in over three years, it lost $194 billion. So that had a massive impact on the population. Of course, we went from a country that had the highest minimum wage in Latin America to one of the lowest. And this, of course, is one of the main drivers of migration outside of Venezuela. We're feeling that migration here in the US now, but initially that migration went to other Latin American countries, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil specifically. But then the pandemic came and those countries really responded poorly to the pandemic. And not only that, but the informal economy where, what meant, where many of these Venezuelan migrants were employed was devastated. So these migrants then returned to Venezuela, some with money, with enough money to pay for these basically human smugglers to take them to cross the Darien Gap and take them by land from Venezuela to the border in Texas. And that's why we've seen so much increased migration uh, in Venezuela, from Venezuela to the US over the past couple of years. So moving beyond these consequences, you know, I think finally we saw people in Congress uh, take a stand against these sanctions and to start drawing the connection between sanctions and migration. And that really put some pressure on the Biden administration to offer sanctions relief, as well as, of course, as, as gas prices and the oil market in general, which have been shaking, which, you know, I think the Biden administration's particularly concerned about, especially getting into the next year's elections, and particularly what summer 2024 may bring for, for oil and gas prices. So last week, about a week and a half ago, there was a deal uh, reached between the Venezuelan government and a coalition of opposition parties. Uh, basically, it was an ele electoral guarantee deal. And as a result of that deal, the United States offered temporary sanctions relief. Uh, really, it's more accurate to say it's not exactly sanctions, the lifting of sanctions, because what the, the U.S. did was that they basically issued general licenses. The Treasury Department issued general licenses so that companies can deal on the Venezuelan oil, gas, and gold. And they basically unblocked the central bank, bank of Venezuela and the biggest bank of Venezuela, which is called the Bank of Venezuela, uh, from financial sanctions for six months. This, is, of course, is a very, very positive step as, you know, finally the administration seems to be understanding the harm that sanctions have caused to the Venezuelan people and also the harm that, that they've caused to U.S. interests, particularly U.S. economic interests and, of course, the migration issue. 
But given that the sanctions are so temp temporary, I think what we can expect to see is a very limited economic impact because companies are going to be very wary of reinvesting in Venezuela if they can run a foul of sanctions in six or 12 months. So I think that's that's one of the big issues that we really need to push on is to ensure that the Biden administration doesn't lift these temporary sanctions. However, we're already seeing kind of the, the, some backtracking on the part of the Biden administration. And there's, there's a bit of been a bit of a disconnect between the Venezuelans and the, and the U.S. regarding this deal that was signed. And when I say the Venezuelans here, I, I mean the Venezuelan government and the opposition parties, because when they signed this electoral guarantee deal, it was clear that it would not include the lifting of the disqualified candidates, that they, those candidates would still be disqualified. But in the immediate aftermath of this deal, you had Secretary Blinken and you had Juan Gonzalez of the National Security Council. They both suggested that the sanctions could be reimposed if they, those candidates weren't allowed to run. Uh, their, their main point of concern is Maria Corina Machado, who won these so-called primaries uh, last Sunday. Honestly, those were easily the least transparent elections in Venezuela over the past 25 years since primaries. They were, they were boycotted by several opposition parties. In the run-up to those primaries, the organizers, several of them quit because of the many problems. So they're not really exactly trustworthy results. And beyond that, when we're talking about Maria Corina Machado, she's someone who called for an invasion of Venezuela. She's someone who's repeatedly called for sanctions against Venezuela. So if you think that, say, for example, that Trump shouldn't be allowed to end here in the U.S., then certainly I think to be coherent, you would have to understand that Maria Corina Machado shouldn't have the ability to win in Venezuela. And then just to move on to what we're looking for today when we're visiting congressional offices and for the staffers that are here with us, we want we would like to ask for continued support uh, for the dialogue between the UN and the US and Venezuela, while ramping up some of that pressure to ensure that the sanctions are not reimposed. Because if you have this idea that, you know, the sanctions might be reimposed if Maduro wins the elections in roughly in late 2024, then that's really tantamount to electoral interference because you're holding a population hostage to this idea, of, oh, we're gonna be sanctioned again, unless we change our vote and vote for someone else. And another issue I really wanna talk about is this fact that in November 2022, again, the government and opposition reached this wide ranging deal on humanitarian needs. And there were gonna be $3.2 billion in frozen funds, Venezuela's money that had been frozen in the council overseas. That money was gonna be released to the United Nations for the UN to administer the funds and spend it on health, education, and the electric grid and other pressing social needs for the Venezuelan people. The Biden administration seemed to be on board with that but they've been dragging their feet. It's already been 11 months and that money has not been released by the Biden administration. So we'd really like to ask Congress to press the Biden administration to release these funds as well. And finally, I'm talking about the issue of migration. You know, one of the big problems that we have here as Venezuelan migrants, myself, my family came about 40 years ago though, is that we don't have consular representation here. So that implies significant problems for any Venezuelan who has, say, problems with the law or who has family in Venezuela that they need to send money to, or you name it. Consular representation is totally necessary. And conversely, U.S. citizens in Venezuela, including people in prison, they also have no consular representation. So we'd like to see Congress push the Biden administration to reestablish consular relations. This doesn't mean that they have to become best friends with the Maduro government or anything of the sort, but this is a very basic you know, step that the US engages in on a daily basis with even countries that are considered greater adversaries in Venezuela, right? There are very few countries that have no consular representation in the United States, and I think North Korea, Venezuela, uh, Iran perhaps, or do they have a consular? They do not. So it's very few countries that don't have consular relations representation, and that's a very key uh, demand from the Venezuelan diaspora in the United States. I think I'll leave it at that just in case folks have questions. Thank you. We now have a few minutes for uh, questions. Uh, I have a question. Is um, is Professor Elner still on the line? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask uh, Professor Elner and Professor Cohn if you could uh, tell us, well, uh, Leonardo just touched on it, but if you could tell us a, a little bit more about um, uh, the impact of sanctions on migration. And uh, we haven't heard as much about, do, do you think there could be any spillover effect into the rest of Central America with the sanctions on Nicaragua? Maybe yes. 
if I can speak first, yes, there is no question about the fact that the deterioration of economic conditions in Venezuela is such that there is a massive uh, outflow of the Venezuelan population, especially young people who are going abroad because there just aren't the opportunities. Uh, students graduate high school, they graduate universities. Um, I'll just give you one example, a personal example. I'm a retired professor. I have taught uh, uh, many years in Venezuela and I retired uh, about 10 years ago. And my pension, which is the same as a salary that an active professor uh, makes, um, was really good by Latin American standards, even by US standards. At this point, I am receiving about $30 a month. That, that, is, that is my salary, that's my pension, and that's the salary of full-time university president. I was a full professor, the highest you know, ranking professor. I was making the maximum in terms of salary. And now that is down to just $30 a month. So students who graduate universities and know full well that as professionals, they're not gonna make enough to make ends meet. They're leaving the country in massive numbers. Some of them are returning now uh, because of difficulties abroad. But I, I just want to say that there are so many ways that Venezuela is adversely affected by the sanctions. And I'll just give you one example. As a U.S. citizen, um, I go back and forth because my wife is Venezuelan. I, I still have a working relationship with my university here in Venezuela. So I go back and forth. Now, I returned to Venezuela in August with my wife. We had to buy two tickets to get here and two tickets to return because the United States government doesn't allow uh, U.S. companies, but also companies any place else in the world. We, we came down here on COPA, which is a Pan Panamanian uh, Airlines. And COPA is not allowed to sell direct tickets um, or not allowed to sell you a ticket in which you go from Washington. You know, I'm based in Maryland. So I go from Washington to Venezuela. And in the past, we would fly Washington, Panama, Venezuela, but it would be, be just one ticket. Now you have to purchase two tickets because the U.S. government doesn't allow COPA to sell a ticket in which the uh, end stop is in Venezuela. So they sell you a ticket from Washington to Panama, and then they, they sell you another ticket. In other words, it's double the price. Um, that's just one example. And it's not a particularly important example when it comes to the starvation wages of Venezuelans as a result of the sanctions. Um, and I also want to just reaffirm what uh, Leo uh, Flores said about the uh, upcoming elections. You know, we are imposing sanctions supposedly in the name of democracy. And yet, how democratic is it that Venezuelans will be going to the polls, this agreement that was just reached uh, last week, uh, in which the Venezuelan government made several concessions to the opposition. And one of them was accepting the date, the approximate date that the opposition wanted for holding presidential elections, which will be at the end, the second half of 2024. Those elections, Venezuelan voters, and I've sp spoken to a number of them, both people who support the government, people who are independent, people who are apathetic, people who are opposed to the government. And they all tell me the same thing. When they go to vote, they're, they're going to have the feeling that they have a gun pointed uh, at their head. If they vote for Maduro, who's the pres actual president, the current president, who's running for re-election, they know full well that sanctions will be maintained. If they vote for the opposition candidate, they know full well that the next day the sanctions will be lifted. Now, that's not democratic. That's not democratic. That is blackmail. That's blackmailing the Venezuelan voter into voting for the candidate the United States supports. So I just wanted to make those comments. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have a question. And would the sanctions on Nicaragua have a spill on Central America? Yeah, so immigration is a bit exaggerated, but they are actually trying to get people to leave Nicaragua, especially who, who is the US government. Like they have they have um sometimes people repost these things on Twitter where the State Department puts out statements about how there are avenues to come to the United States and available to Nicaraguans and they 
make it easier, he's uh, calling it a probationary period, to try to increase uh, the immigration. Uh, while they tell the people in the United States that they're trying to stop the immigration. You know, they're, they're talking out of both sides of their mouth, literally there. Uh, but there was quite a bit of immigration for a while, especially as it was around 2000, uh, when they, they started to, one of the other things they did is they made it possible for a lot of people to uh, migrate legally. So many people who had already been in Costa Rica had been living there and were given basically recognition. And so it looks like a huge number all of a sudden. But the numbers have been going down. Or 2020? Um, I'm sorry, 2020. Yeah, 2020. So um, in my age, it's the other decade or two, and I'm down. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so so the, the numbers at times are bad, and it's due to unemployment, it's due to you know all the all of these problems. But one thing when we're talking about Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua, they're all in different stages of sanctions. So the thing is that you can look at Nicaragua and you can look at it being a pretty nice place. But the reason it is is that the sanctions haven't really hit that hard yet. And the sanctions aren't as bad yet, but they want to move it to where Venezuela and Cuba are. Yeah. Um, and that is the important thing to understand. It isn't Venezuela's fault or Cuba's fault that they have that they're struggling in some of these areas. It's because the sanctions have been in place so long and they're so much more uh, stringent. But in Nicaragua, they're starting to have an effect. And you know, certainly they lost billions of dollars in funding for new projects for you know more hospitals and things like that. So that that development, it's not going to be advancing as fast. Um, but the the real effects of the of the blocking of the loans takes a while for that to affect. The other part of the question was on Honduras. So U.S. is Nicaragua's leading trading partner. Honduras is number two. Nicaragua exports uh, beans, a lot of beans to Honduras. So actual food, the, the most important source of protein in their diet. And so when you, the U.S., the latest rounds of sanctions, they're trying to disrupt the CAFTA agreement, cut Nicaragua out so that Nicaragua won't be able to meet food uh, shipments to Honduras because that's supposed to be the domain of the United States to provide the food when we want to. Um, and also the U.S. isn't real happy with the government, the current elected government of Honduras. They had supported a coup government for since 2009 until recently. And they eventually just could not keep that that uh, illegitimate government in power any longer. People had just turned too far against them. And so they gave up and they said, well, you know, we still have the military base. We can still reverse things when we need to, but they allowed this more left-leaning president take place. But she's walking a tightrope between the, the drug kingpins that represented the old government and they still have a lot of influence in their society. So the U.S. is not really sure, you know, at any point they could, impose sanctions on Honduras as well. So, but the, the real immediate effect is cutting, you know, blocking the economy, Nicaragua from being able to trade with Honduras will have a huge impact on Honduras. So then we'll see the conditions there worsen that they're now the second poorest country in the hemisphere. Um, and it used to be Nicaragua was, but now they've changed places a little bit. Um, you know, this these are very, very poor countries, and there's already a huge amount of immigration from Honduras, from El Salvador as well, and another major trading site. Any other questions? Yes. The fact that the money was being the money in Nicaragua was being affected. Yeah. And so, yeah, the comment on that, the, the World Bank, I've actually been working with the World Bank, I have. they require a lot, a lot of reporting. And so they end up getting very good data, and they're very, very critical. And they found it to be one of the most, uh, the Bank had having some of the most some of the best executed projects in the world, that they were very, very happy with their uh, with their reporting. In fact, uh, La Prensa, one of the CIA-backed newspapers that was operating in Nicaragua, claimed that 
the World Bank was cutting funding to Nicaragua because of their the Sandinista's incompetence. And the World Bank actually responded and, and wrote a, in a letter saying that, no, actually, they are extremely confident. They're very happy with everything they've done. They've always met all the requirements. And, you know, but we're cutting our funding, but they had to cut the funding because of the U.S. pressure that, that was required to take that. Uh, <clears throat> Can I say another hand? Yes. I'm wondering, uh, do you think that the Congress people that were going to be visiting believe, as several of you have said, that sanctions are really the reason for them is to lead to regime change? Well, you might turn around and ask about <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, congressional. I mean, it's said in the bill. In the 1881, it actually said change. They call it, you know, uh, free elections, <laughs> where Daniel Ortega is the best. Did you change? Because, okay, remember, it used to be as long as we get rid of Philadelphia Castro, everything will be fine. And we'll, you know, Philadelphia Castro is what? The more few presidents pass, we're still on Cuba, right? It wasn't Fidel Castro, it's not Daniel Ortega, it's the party. It is their sovereignty that they're opposed to. So they say they want to overthrow, replace Daniel Ortega, and they want to do away with the law that prohibits U.S. companies and U.S. government from funding their elections. Um, those are the two things. So one is maybe more an objective, but obviously it's really changed. change. They, they look at all of it. I would also add I think there are some people in Congress who might not agree with the regime change goals in some of these cases, but they will still vote for sanctions because they see it as a lesser evil. And I think that's one of the things that had sanctions kill, we've really been trying to press, is that it's not a lesser evil. It still causes tens of thousands of deaths. So, um, I think we can uh, resume conversation informally, but I... I'd like to thank everyone up. for coming, thank the presenters, and uh, we will close this portion, uh, but of course everyone is welcome to stay and talk. Yeah, we have the room to the and please uh, tell yourself to and pause and give some feedback to your Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.